And there's a beauty that happens in the changing of the guard. And so I'm just looking forward to this because as we're growing and bringing more people in, the energy that comes with new leadership is just magic. So I can't wait to see what our new group will do. So we've gotten more council members. We've gotten uh, lots of folks involved in teams. So the energy of this community is palpable. It's just wonderful. So wish us well on our retreat this afternoon. Um, the Youth and Family Program is focusing on Jesus in the Mar month, of March, month of March on Sunday. Their topic is, I am the light, I make a difference. Way to go, Youth and Family Team. Every week we have a prayer chaplain that's available to pray. My notes say it's Barbara Weimer. There we go. Robert thought it might be him, but it's actually Barbara. Thank you, Barb. Um, turn and look at the back wall and do an ooh and ah with me. Ooh, ah. These are irises, not the flower kind, the eye kind. And our own Richard is a professional photographer, and that's his work. So, ooh, ah, Richard. <clears throat> um, announcements? Come on up, folks, who have them. Good morning. I'm Will. We've had a lot of interest in creating a unity walking group. Our first event is tomorrow. The weather is going to be a little iffy, so uh, that's, that's the rumor. Mary and I are going to show up. We're going to park. Anybody interested? I've, I've emailed everybody who's signed up so far. If you want to join in, we'll be meeting in the west parking lot of the Museum of Discovery in Fort Collins and at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And if the weather is okay, we'll walk west along the river. If it's not, we'll go to Das Bog and drink coffee and tea. So we have good choices. So if you're interested, see me afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Will. We'll have good company, too. Um, so I'm not going to pass around a clipboard today. The curry dinner is April the 7th. It's over there. You don't have to have the curry. You can just have all the other stuff. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about, and I'm not going to pass anything around today, is that we're going to have a book group, and the book we're going to have is Boys in the Boat. That's the first book we're going to read, and a dinner will follow. But we will pass something up, out about that next month, and then you can sign up and we can talk. Thanks. Oh, wait, I don't want to follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good call. Good call. Good call. I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. Uh, my wife and I and Kimber and Mike and I don't remember who are starting the teen group. So we're going to try to start a meeting, um, or have a meeting on this, no, I'm sorry, either Tuesday or Thursday of this week or next week. No specifics yet. But if you're interested, please get in touch with me or Steph, my wife, or Kimber back there. Kimber's back there. Um, if you know anybody that's interested, hopefully Leela's, uh, you know, recruiting for us. <laughs> but anyway, all right, now the final. Okay. Yeah, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's springtime now, and it's time for our... Um, springtime cleanup, and that'll be taking place on April 20th. And by the way, I'm Jim Weimar, and I'm the new co-facilities um, um, person, and I'm in charge of the outside. Um, we'll be doing lots of projects, um, indoor and outdoor, and we will be providing lunch around noontime, so I'll be passing around the clipboard. And um, thanks, everybody. Here, here. <laughs> Here, here. Jim, you can stay close with the ears because we have a magnificent Easter 
morning service planned for you. Our music team, led by John Magney and Elise Wonder, will feature guest musicians and the Unity Choir. Rev Jim and Sharon will be sharing the Easter story, but as per usual, it's the weird version. <laughs> they will invite you to go roll the stone of self away and let the spirit of God within you arise. Yeah. And the Youth and Family Ministry Group will be having an Easter egg hunt for all ages following. The Monday Expanding Consciousness Circle will meet in the roomy room from 6.30 to 8.30. Anisha and Dave are the leaders of that. Um, there's one change to Rev. Jim's new class on spirituality, Many Lenses, Same Essence. You can attend in person on Tuesday at 6.30 in the sanctuary or via Zoom on Thursday at 6.30. So Tuesday in person, Thursday on Zoom. <clears throat> we did the cleanup. Um, the musician team, J.D. and Jan, who often come to Unity many times over the years, are planning to come. And they're looking for a place to stay. The trick is it needs to be pet-free. So we're looking for a pet-free host for J.D. and Jan. Thank you so much. All right. Let's take a deep breath together. Our unity centers us in light and peace, allowing us to recognize our God within and to radiate that love to the world. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be playing music for you, and along with Kelsey and Leela. So, I'm not getting any monitors. I'm excited because this is well, the first time I've brought this song to the stage. I wrote this about 15 years ago. <laughs> and it's really just about that searching journey that we all go on. Can you hear me? Can you hear my guitar? Yeah? Cool. I might just go for it. I don't have the guitar on my monitor, but I can still hear. As long as you can hear. Oh, there it is. I love this new sound system, by the way. It sounded really good. We're just learning it. Walking downtown and I'm feeling alone Standing on the corner, don't know which way to go And there's a bum down beside me, he's a playing his guitar I'm dropping change in his tin can and oh my soul you can't take it with you when you go trudging through the everglades in the dead of the night pushing up ahead there's a fire burning bright and it's a cold cruel world till you get there To find they've been waiting just for you all along And oh, bless my soul You can't quit when you gotta go I 
see the dead of night coming to an end. I see the morning light open in her tired eyes. I see the dead of night coming to an end. Walking down the road and I'm feeling alone. I'm stepping on the cracks in the middle of the road. I get there. I get there. And now for a reading from Leela. How do you follow that? Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, this is Auguries of Innocence by William Blake. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. A dove house filled with doves and pigeons shudders hell through all its regions. The lamb misused breeds public strife and yet forgives the butcher's knife. He who shall hurt the little wren shall never be beloved by men. He who the ox to wrath has moved shall never be by woman loved. A truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies that you can invent. It is right, it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. Joy and woe are woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silk and twine. Tools were made and born were hands. Every farmer understands. Every tear from every eye becomes a babe in eternity. He who shall teach the child to doubt, the rotting grave shall near get out. He who respects the infant's faith triumphs over hell and death. The child's toys and the old man's reasons are the fruit of the two seasons. The questioner who sits so sly shall never know how to reply. He who replies to words of doubt doth put the light of knowledge out. He who doubts from what he sees will near believe, do what you please. If the sun and mood should doubt, they'd immediately go out. Every night and every morn, some to misery are born. Every morn and every night, some are born to sweet delight. We are led to believe a lie when we see not through the eye, which was born in a night to perish in a night. When the soul slept in beams of light, God appears and God is light to those poor souls who dwell in night. Does a human form display to those who dwell in realms of day? And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. Thank you. Okay. Please welcome to the family my new ukulele. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. I've been looking for it for a, a long time. And please sing along to this song. Um, the lyrics are a relatively loose suggestion, but you're just going to do a little bit free form. Let the spirit flow, right? Mm -hmm. Can you hear my uke? Oh. 
sun way over the rainbow. There's a land that I heard of once in a long love. Jeez. Oh, man. Medicine woman in our midst, right? So good. All right. If you ever want to feel really good before you speak, have that happen. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to tell you a story today. But because it's church, I'm going to start with a confession. Because it's on brand, right? So... My confession for the day is that I cannot eat gas station food anymore. <laughs> not when I'm desperate, not when I'm starving. I cannot eat gas station food ever again in my life. Now, I bet that you're going, oh my gosh, what horrible thing happened to her? What's going on? I, mean, I know your imagination is going crazy, but just stop. Because whatever you're thinking is way weirder than that. <laughs> Actually, whatever, whatever, what, what really happened is way weirder. So, the reason I cannot eat gas station food anymore is because the summer between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college, I spent the summer touring the country in a Christian rock band. <laughs> yeah, you're going to think I'm cool for about three seconds when I tell you that that's also the summer that I got my belly button pierced and that we performed for about 30,000 people. And that at one point um, throughout the entire summer, we actually had a camera crew following us around because they were making a documentary about us. But 
very quickly, the coolness points are going to start to go down when I also admit that I refused to get my belly button pierced with everyone else until I got my mom on the phone and got her permission. <laughs> and then after it happened, I fainted on the table because it hurt that bad. It really did. And that uh, it didn't take us very long to figure out that having a camera in your face all the time is nobody's idea of a good time. And that some days we had to be on the bus for so many hours. And the only place to stretch our legs and the only place to buy food was a gas station. Hence, my now lifelong aversion to eating gas station food. But at the time, I didn't care. Because being part of this band was a dream. So... This was a youth band, uh, teens to 20s, made up of kids in the ELCA Lutheran Synod all over the country. Now, I was once one of hundreds of teens from across the country to send in audition tapes, and actually getting chosen was a dream come true. Now, Sharon, I don't know where she was. I saw her earlier. Sharon's told us, there we go. You've told us a lot of stories about growing up Lutheran. Now, as luck would have it for me, my version was not nearly as fire and brimstone as yours, but I know we've heard lots of different stories. The version I grew up with was a church here in Fort Collins on the south side of town, and church was really just about community and music. After the service, my best friend and I would run to the fellowship hall and fill these plastic cups full of donut holes and then go hide in the bathroom and gossip for as long as we could stand before we got really guilty and felt like we should go to Sunday school. So we'd go in for the rest and pretend like everything was perfect. So if you would have, I know, right? It's a good strategy. If you would have asked me about my connection to God at that point, I probably would have told you something that I thought sounded really good, but then tried to ignore the fact that secretly church did not move me one bit, but I was very worried that it should. But the truth is I felt really no connection to the God that we talked about every Sunday. To the people, absolutely. To the message, I mean, I, I knew what we were getting at, and I could recite it to you, and I could sing all the songs, but if I'm being honest, I was just showing up and going through the motions and waiting for it to be over. A few weeks ago, when Anne did her talk about the Lord's Prayer in the Aramaic, I identified with it so much. And... I can see my younger self not at all relating to this translation of a translation of a translation and wondering if I was sitting in this room where everyone felt like this. Was this like this emperor's new clothes moment that nobody wanted to talk about? Or was I somehow the only one who wasn't getting it? Sometimes I let it bother me, but usually I just didn't let it be a big problem. So instead of focusing on finding God, I just focused on the things that did actually already feel like magic in my life, like music and like my family. <laughs> you just missed a really cute mug from my kid. <laughs> and uh, like nature and connection and this creativity I couldn't explain, but I just felt was pouring out of me. And I felt like whatever God was, he had to be on the side of this music, right? Because otherwise, how would I have gotten this opportunity to go be in this band? I was like, this is a pivotal moment. This is how I'm gonna, this is how I'm gonna meet God. I thought, this was, this was how I was gonna really understand spirituality. I was gonna go out on my own for the first time. I was gonna meet all of these people who were like super talented and spiritually led. This had to be where I was gonna find it. And which is why it took me so off guard about my second week in the band when this happened. So we were in Seattle for a few weeks, just practicing before we went out on tour. And a few of the musicians asked if I wanted to go out to their favorite old dingy diner. Now, it looked exactly like where you would think a grungy 90s Seattle rock band would hang out, and I was like, this is so cool, right? So most of the musicians had been together for a lot of years, and at 17, I was the youngest one, so I was very eager to fit in and very excited to be invited on this little field trip. So as the conversation progressed, it, something puzzling really started to happen, which is that one by one, it started becoming clear to me that not one of these other musicians actually believed in God. And it wasn't like this was some big taboo thing they were admitting. It's like they were all in on the secret and they just kept up the charade so they got to keep being a part of this amazing musical experience. I remember one of the trombonists saying, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're born in North America, you grow up learning about Jesus. If you're born in Asia, it's Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna. We're all taught that this is the one and only way and it's just as arbitrary as anything else. All of our songs are bullshit. That God doesn't exist. And then the conversation moved on and they were laughing and 
like eating these soggy fries, but my mind totally disengaged from the conversation. I remember that everything in that diner was stainless steel and it all suddenly seemed really bright. I remember getting very quiet and most of all, feeling really naive and really confused and really heartbroken. Now, when I look back on that moment years later, I sometimes wonder how my inner life would have been different if I were a person who got fired up about something like this rather than shut down. I wonder what would, I would, ha I wonder what would have happened if I would have asked more questions. Maybe there would have been a conversation about comparative religion. Maybe my bandmates would have talked about these beautiful similarities they'd found across all of these different uh, religious systems. They just weren't particularly fired up by the Lutheran version. I wonder what would have happened if I had been curious, but I wasn't. I felt no curiosity at all in that moment because all I could feel was this giant wash of shame and fear. Shame because I just felt young and like this unsophisticated newbie who had nothing to contribute to this conversation and fear that maybe they were right and maybe there was no God. So I did what I always did when things got hard in those days, which is I decided to ignore it and pretend like it didn't exist, which you might know is a strategy that works really great until it doesn't, but I didn't know that yet either. So I decided for the second time to just stop worrying about finding God and lean into the magic I was already feeling. And then it was like this magic of 20 musicians who have no plan, but suddenly you're so in sync, it's like you're all reading each other's minds and leaning into the magic and the true joy of meeting new people all across the country and realizing that we really are way more alike than we are different. Sometimes the big God question would come into my head when I was lying in bed at night in some new city across the country. And I tried not to think about that schism I was feeling in my own body. And I certainly did not tell anyone about it. So summer ended and it was time for college and I was still leaning into music. Um, I'd gotten into my dream school, which is this elite musical, musical theater conservatory in Cincinnati. So basically I had a triple major in singing and dancing and acting, and it was the most fun you could ever possibly have at college. Uh, a few months before graduation, yeah, yeah, you got me, totally. <laughs> a few months before graduation, uh, I met up with a casual friend for a date, because we wanted to see if there was something more between us. And we decided to try to be cool and do a different kind of first date thing and talk about something real instead of just all the small talk. So, I told him about what it was like to be in a program where you were constantly trained to think about yourself as a product. Not very healthy, right? Talked about that for a while. Now, when it was his turn, he told me about what it was like growing up in a really strict Catholic family, about the constant vigilance, and about how penance and the idea of original sin had bled into every aspect of their lives, and about how damaging that had been for him. I'd heard about this before, this Catholic guilt, but I just never really seen the effects up close. I told him about what church was like for me, about how it was all donut holes and friends and singing, and we both sat in wonder about how far apart two experiences of the same thing could be. And then he asked me if I wanted to hear about this philosophical proof he had learned that had helped him so much and it had changed his entire belief system. And I was like, of course I wanna hear about that. So he started laying out, line by line, a very well-constructed, rational argument for how there could not possibly be a God. And how from a scientific standpoint, matter had to exist before consciousness. I remember listening to each piece of this argument fall into place with a certainty of a mathematical equation. And what I didn't say with my face, this mask of polite interest, was that this way of looking at things that had given him so much peace felt like it was ripping me apart from the inside out. I was depressed for about two years after that, and I didn't tell anybody. That was during the time of college graduation and moving to New York City and trying to make it on my own for the first time. All under this giant umbrella of dread and devastation, now again, as an adult, I mean, I look back on that sweet, scared version of myself and I wish so many things. I wish I would have talked to anyone about this. Just to give that pit in my stomach some breathing room, I wish 
that I would have had the vocabulary and the context to understand that there are so many ways to tell the story of the cosmos and that people have been trying for millennia. I wish that I would have understand that if we grow up in the East, we tend to explain things that we don't understand in metaphors and in stories. And in the West, we just don't feel comfortable with that. We want science, right? We want spreadsheets. And I wish I would have known that science has proven every single day that the more we learn about the universe, the more we realize we don't know anything. But I didn't because I was so schooled in that methodical Western way of thinking that I was that fish in the water that didn't know I was in it because it's all I had ever known. So this time I didn't just decide to stop my quest for God and lean into the magic in the world. I just stopped. And everything got really quiet for a while. And I felt very lost and then there's a bunch of other stories. But we'll pick up again about six years later, still in New York, when I was working this crazy high fashion job that was very stressful. And so at the same time, I was really getting into yoga. And I started realizing that my yoga practice was feeling more like a personal connected religious experience than church ever had. That's weird, right? Now, it could have been because my favorite class was on Sunday mornings, or it could have been because my favorite yoga teacher looked and sounded exactly like Antonio Banderas. <laughs> And he would say these things like, the path towards evolution starts with involution, right? <laughs> that room was packed, let me tell you. <laughs> now, I knew that yoga wasn't a religion per se, but the more that I went, the more I started feeling really clear and really grounded and more connected to myself than I ever had been. And a few years later, alongside my regular job, I actually got certified as a yoga teacher because I really wanted to dig into this. And that's when I started learning about the spiritual aspects of that tradition. So you see, the physical part, like the postures, the part we all see, that's just one teeny tiny part of the system, right? And the entire point of all of that is just to still you enough to be calm enough to meditate. It's like the same reason we send kids out for recess to get the wiggles out, it's the same concept. The point though is what happens after the movement. Now, I found that very funny that all the things that we spend so much time and money on in the West, that's the warm up act, it's not even the main event. So the yogic way of explaining the world was so different than anything I'd ever known. It was rich with poetry and imagery, and I fell in love with like, the system of chakras and the idea that there's this energy coiled at the base of your spine like a serpent. And I also felt at home with the fact that no one actually believed that there are these spinning balls of light inside you or that there's a snake inside your body. It was just that we all accepted that it was this poetic language to describe a common experience. And though yoga is not part of the religion of Hinduism, because they were birthed of the same people, I did learn quite a lot about that too. I fell in love with the fact that there are many gods in that religion that all represent unique aspects of this universal energy. One, you've probably heard of Ganesh, the god with a giant elephant face, yeah, I see you in the back, um, is often called the remover of obstacles. But here's something fun that I learned when I started digging into it, which is that this particular deity is not responsible for only removing obstacles in your life, but also for putting them there in the first place. Yeah. I loved this idea that both placing and removing obstacles could be equally done for you, not to punish you. What a revelation to think of a benevolent being putting something in your way for you to learn a lesson, not because you'd done something wrong and you needed to be punished, but because it was what you needed for the next step in the evolution of your consciousness. It was a completely different way of thinking, and I loved it. And the more I started learning about spirituality in this poetic language, the more I came alive. And I started to say, oh yeah, I recognize myself in this, and I recognize myself in that. Now, as humans, we know that it is supremely comforting to be able to wrap language, about our, uh, wrap language around our experience of the world. And that is what started happening for me. And the more I was digging, the better it got. I learned about Vedanta philosophy and dualism and non-dualism and Tantra and various sects of Hinduism. And because I was an outsider looking in, I was able to have some perspective and appreciate the stories and the cultures and the teachings for when and where they were planted in history. And then I started allowing the same lens to shine over my own upbringing and my own Christian roots. I would think about that conversation in the Seattle diner, and it was never far from my mind, and the conversation that at that time had felt like blasphemy, with my new eyes, instead of filling me with dread, it filled me with wonder. Because instead of hearing those words and seeing a void, now all I could see were the threads tying everything together. 
I started trekking down to the Buddhist Museum on West 15th Street. I would spend weekends with my friends at this ashram in upstate New York where, for some reason, I remember the, I remember the only thing we would ever eat was cinnamon toast for like three days in a row. So there's some good meditation systems, right? I, I almost couldn't help learning more about Judaism because my married last name was Kaufman and I lived on the Upper East Side, so people just figured I was part of the club. I um, would go to the Met Museum on my days off and read these translations of Zen cones behind the glass. And the more I learned, the more I started seeing how all of these maps overlaid on each other and how they influenced each other and spoke to each other and referenced each other. Now, of course, I realized I could have gotten there a lot more quickly if I would have just taken a comparative religions course or come to Jim's Tuesday class. But I didn't know that's what I was doing. All I knew is that I was on this giant scavenger hunt. And every place I looked, I kept retrieving pieces of myself. And what started to happen is that in looking at so many traditions, ways of looking at God and the universe and this creation energy, I started to have a completely different idea of what we're even talking about. This God force, this universal consciousness. As Courtney said a few months ago, I, this, it's this visual I still can't forget. It's this, uh, like the breeze underneath the wings of birds. As the months went by, I started to realize that I actually knew this energy. At each of those turning points in my life, where I had thought my Western-trained brain had not been able to understand and I was just going to forget my quest for God and lean into the magic, I had already found it. It felt like a very Wizard of Oz moment to realize that this thing I had been seeking had been in me all along and that it's the same energy as the energy inside a seed and the energy that keeps breathing this animal of my body even if my brain is not paying attention and even if my logic doesn't get it. And a certain peace started to come over me when I realized that it doesn't actually matter what anyone else says about it. They can call it whatever they want, and they can believe in it or not, because whatever you call it, it is happening. And it is inside me, and it's inside you right now. And we can use it to dance and paint and create, or we can ignore it. But it is there, and it is waiting to be danced with. And I remember this when a piece of music that beautiful tumbles out of Elise. That's this energy spinning through the instrument of her body. And when any artist is asked, how did you do that? And they're like, I don't know, it just came out. That is this energy spinning through them. And the fun part is the instrument of your body is gonna spin it differently than the instrument of my body. And that, I have come to believe, is how we truly come to know ourselves to listen deeply enough to that thrum of the universe inside of you, and then to trust it, and then to be brave enough to let it come through you in a way that is personal and vulnerable and in a voice that could only ever be yours. It's like that Mark Nepo quote that Leanne shared in her reading last week. It's the difference be between becoming a singer and becoming the song. But how, you might ask, I asked that for so many years. How do we do that? And like Anne shared with us a few weeks ago, sometimes the way something is translated makes all the difference. So if we go back to yoga for a moment, I'd always known that yoga meant union. A lot of times people think of it as the union of the mind, body, and the spirit. But sometimes people also talk about it in terms of the union of you and the divine. It's always some kind of yoking though. So my favorite translation is from a teacher named Indra Devi. And she's the only female teacher in the original wave of teachers to bring yoga to the West. She translates it as, when consciousness rests in the heart. Yeah, I still get chills in my body whenever I think of it like that. So think about it, if what we're seeking is union, of knowing God, being one with the divine, we don't have to do anything. Because the state just arises when our consciousness rests in the heart. We don't have to make sense of anything. We just need to let our navigational system move from here to here. That's all we need to connect to the real essence of the universe. And after that whole crazy adventure, that's all I needed. I know now that I don't need everyone else to agree with my version. I don't need to go on a Christian rock band tour or eat any more gas station food. I don't need a philosophical proof proving my point. And I don't even need to worry if I do all these things and they go so wrong because I happen to like the idea of an elephant god from someone else's religion halfway across the world putting all of those things in my path on purpose, specifically 
so that I could go on a scavenger hunt and find all of those pieces that felt true for me. Because now it feels like mine. And that trust that I have and that knowing is unshakable. I guess the elephant god knew that I would need my lesson another way because I was eating donut holes and skipping Sunday school anyways. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to see what it feels like to move your consciousness on purpose. So if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. You're just going to ask yourself to think about a couple things, if it feels safe. So I just want you to ask yourself, can I imagine the distance between my eyes? Hmm. Can I imagine the distance between my eyes? Can I imagine the distance between the top of my head and the base of my chin? Can I imagine that three-dimensional volume inside my skull? Can I imagine the distance between the top of my head and the bottom of my tailbone? Can I feel the three-dimensional cavity inside the basket of my ribs? Can I feel all the atoms that make up that space inside the cavity of my ribs? And now can I imagine the space inside each one of those atoms? because the atom is mostly space, after all. Can I imagine that space inside me and feel how it's connected to the space outside of me? Can I feel how that space inside of me is connected to the space inside of the person sitting next to me? And the space inside of the person sitting next to them? and the space inside the atoms of the trees outside the window. Can I hear the silence below the space that makes every sound possible? Now can I imagine this tiny golden light that is animating my own heart. 
And can I sense the thread of it connecting to the heart of the person next to me and the person next to them? And can I see the golden web spreading out and connecting my heart to the thrum of the universe in every other being? Now can I come back to my own heart? And be with that animating force as it breathes the animal that is me. Thank you, Kelsey, for that message. I just wish we could expand it from about 20 minutes to 20 hours. There's so much truth in that. You know, it's much better to live in the question than in dogmatic certainty. And there's so many questions. And maybe the, the God of our imagination is not the same God that breathes us. And I think Kelsey's message is certainly gives us that indication. In fact, looked over, here's one of the Tuesday night lessons of our class on spirituality. The question here is the problem of evil. Why does evil exist in the world? So those are some of the questions, many questions, and questions are okay. And thank you for allowing us to question, Kelsey. So it's time for our offering. So let's have the ushers come forward and let's bless our offering. Just hold it in your hands and just be thankful and grateful for all that we have as a community all we're allowed to give. So together, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, all that I receive. Thank you, God. I'm honored that Kelsey asked me to play this song too. I wrote it for the, the sea, the deep blue sea. That really we are, we are this deep blue sea, we are an ocean of awareness and of being in the waves of emotion. Don't define us, they are a part of us. I was laying, I was back floating in the ocean once and I was a little scared because I'm like, whoa, I'm doing this, like I'm just surrendering to this beast, this huge being. And this big wave crashed over me. And it was so wild because my head was facing the wave. And it crashed over me in a way that 
It didn't stop my breathing. It didn't stop. It didn't interrupt my breath. I didn't have to hold my breath. It was really cool. Let it 
shine. I feel the bushel, the bushel. I said, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, say, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Uh huh. Say, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I said, let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Good morning. So today we continued our series on Jesus and learning about Jesus for the month. And we spoke today about changes that they would like to see in the world. Um, also changes that they could make in the world and what those results would be. And then we talked about that we all have the power within us to make our own choices sometimes <laughs> and sometimes the choices are made by others for us in our lives when especially when we're young <laughs> so did you want to add anything no. it was a great group <laughs> it was a great group with them today it was wonderful and then we have some young ones in the back that didn't want to come up on stage but it was a great time nice job. <laughs> well thank you Denise you said it all Good. So let's go ahead and circle up as we close our service. So I trust you're holding someone's hand. So why don't you turn and introduce yourself to that person real quickly, okay? Okay, so we now have our prayer protection of the peace song. So together, the light of God surrounds us the love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is swell. Yes.